Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Chris Fryman. It's nice to have you on the show. Please, for everyone out there listening who might not know who you are, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me on. I'm a, uh, an associate professor of philosophy at William & Mary, and I work primarily on topics in political philosophy. And my most recent book is titled, Why It's Okay to Ignore Politics. And the, the very short summary of that book is that you can do more good for the world by ignoring politics by not engaging in formal political activism, and instead working on private philanthropic projects instead. Why do you think people feel the need to get involved in the politics? Like it's always trending. And it always seems like now people are introducing themselves with more of their political identity before their name even it seems like you, someone walks up, shake your hand, they go, I'm a Democrat, my name is this. And it's like, well, uh, what? Like, it's just, it's just different. Um, I've always stood like you can talk about politics, even though at the dinner table that was always mentioned, don't talk about politics, don't talk about religion, don't talk about all this. But today's time is what everyone's talking about. And I realized like, it's a lot of pick a side. Like there's no more sitting on the sidelines anymore. There's no more just being uh, worried about issues that involve you. It's a lot about like, you need to have an overall say in every single thing. And, and for a lot of people like myself, that's just, I'm not, I, I mean, I'll talk about politics, but I don't have a side of who's better. I'm sorry. I don't like the, besides the background being purple, I don't have a red versus blue type stance. I'm more on this aspect of like, I think, you know, you can point flaws at both. You can say benefits on both. But when we talk about business corporations or all these types of things that do get involved in the politics where I feel like they shouldn't be, that's where I more have issues. It's like a corruption aspect. I think you're, you're right that a big part of political involvement uh, is, is that it enables people to express their what you might call social identity. Like you said, people now really strongly identify themselves with their politics. So somebody, somebody's a Democrat or somebody is a Republican or a socialist or a libertarian. And this is a very big part of their social identity. It informs who they hang out with, the sorts of discussions they have. And now we're actually seeing political identities infiltrate all other aspects of our lives. So the, the uh, stores that you shop at, the TV shows that you watch, all of these things seem to be influenced by our politics now. So, you know, if you, you, you know, if you're a Democrat, you're more likely to shop at Whole Foods. If you're a Republican, you're more likely to shop at Walmart and so on. So it really has soaked up quite a bit of our identities. And I think that's one reason why politics loom so large in public discussion. I, I think another aspect to it, though, is simply that politics does deal with extremely important and weighty issues. And so this is something I, I should probably just clarify right off the bat. Uh, you know, my view is that it's it's totally okay for uh, a person to ignore politics and to to redirect their moral efforts elsewhere into non-political uh, sort of spheres. That doesn't mean that politics itself is unimportant. I think politics is important, and I think it's good that we have uh, people who are engaged in it. But I look at it as something similar to farming or dentistry. Farming is important. Dentistry is important. That doesn't mean everybody has to be a farmer. It doesn't mean everybody has to be a dentist. And most people intuitively recognize this when we're talking about things like farming and dentistry. But for some reason, when it comes to politics, uh, it's, it's as though everybody has to get involved. And that's what I disagree with. I don't think that everybody has to get involved. I 100% I, I agree with you. I see this is weird. When I started talking to a lot of people like involved in like space uh, travel, there's a space lawyer I had on. We we're talking about space because it all boils down to politics. I'm like, what space does? And we talk about renewable energies, politics, like every single person I've talked to in specific topics where I'm really trying to avoid the political bend, they always find a way to skew it that way. And I'm like, that's not good because I think that conditions you to think that there's it's always going to be tied in like that. It's kind of like my brain in Disney. I think Disney suddenly just owns everything because it seems like they're everywhere you look. Now, 
that is the same exact thing with politics. I'm like, there, no, there's core things we could talk about without even that being dropped in. And I think it's actually probably a bigger hindrance because it's a side thing. Like people, when it gets to that side thing, it takes away from the core issues. Like I've always said, like, I think the best thing possible is to have private organizations or things with people that are actually passionate about the things that they're actually doing and not letting them have this corrupting aspect, which is that form or that pool being politics or money for instance, I mean, they should have money to be able to spend with what they need to do to make the efforts that they need to do that we all see as a benefit to society. But just power these things, these way that we deemed it with media and all these types of things are so corrupting. And it you lose track of the main mission where it's like, will we have renewable energies by now? Would we have a more focus? You talked about anybody in renewable energies. It's a great subject to point at if you really want to kind of take it away from the politics aspect, which is solar water, any of these types of things. There's everyone involved in one specific area. And it's like, if you're pro solar, then you can't talk to the hydro person. It's like, well, we're, we're all working towards the same goal. If I'm not wrong, it's just that we're all driving different vehicles. I'm just curious if we're going to keep hitting this stump or this, is this a halt in society that just always happens? Is there always have to be bickering? Does there always have to be a problem in someone's life? Is this recorded through history? Or is this just something that's just been influenced by something that it probably should have never left the TV? Yeah, that's a great question. I do think that polarization has gotten worse recently. There's, there's uh, strong evidence suggesting that that's the case. But, but, but you're right. I mean, so many conversations now that, that seem as though they wouldn't have much to do with politics do always, you know, that you're, you're talking about the dinner table conversations and you could be talking about anything and inevitably it drifts to politics and then inevitably it leads to conflict. You, ha you have a very unhappy Thanksgiving dinner if you're arguing about, uh, about Donald Trump. The, the irony is I should just say is sort of an aside. I, you know, I, you know, I'm a political philosopher, so I, you know, I like arguing about politics. But for me, it's, you know, I do that because I think it's enjoyable. But, I, but a lot of people, it really upsets them and stresses them out. And there's a lot of evidence that people's anxiety does rise as they pay more attention to politics and when their side loses. And, and a, another aspect too, so you're talking about, for instance, renewable energy, where you would say, well, uh, it seems as though we're all working towards the same goal, but now we're choosing sides and it's I don't know, solar versus hydro or something like that, where you have to be on opposite teams. I mean, I think clearly that dynamic is at play in, in politics, where, you know, you, you define yourself partly uh, in opposition to the other party. Um, and I think this creates social conflict. I think it also makes it harder to have good faith discussions and arguments with the other side, where we could say, look, Possibly I have something to learn from you. You have something to learn from me. And so let's have a discussion that might actually be mutually illuminating. I think that be, has, has become less common and it's much more, you know, how do I beat the other side? How do I embarrass the other side and make them look bad? And the irony is this leads to worse politics. If you think politics is, is really important and that people do have this strong moral obligation to participate in politics, then ideally we would want political discourse to be less adversarial, more charitable, less biased, which actually I think requires us to, to you know, um, step back from our own partisan commitments a little bit. So when you're working with political philosophy, how do you get started in something like that? Did you just start noticing that there was a lot of things that people would steer away from or wouldn't talk about in fear? Like to me, it's like, I wouldn't even take a jump this far, but in a sense, it's like brainwashing. You're having people that are self-censoring themselves on a fear aspect of what they might say based on their political party. I mean, maybe it's always been like that. It seems like we always had a crazy uncle or someone that would always rant about something, you know, at the dinner table, but now everyone's kind of talking about it. And I think that's only happened because the media has kind of put it everywhere you look. I mean, you look on Google, it's the first thing you see, unless it's like a weather disaster or some type of war effort thing. And maybe it's good to be aware, but I also think being too aware of a lot of things that you can't change puts you in this inevitable crisis where you have these inner conflicts of maybe I need to take a stand, but I'm like, your tweet doesn't do anything. 
like changing your profile picture to a Ukrainian flag. I mean, it's, it shows good that you're supporting, but does that help the issue that's being happened? Or is it just, it, it, it makes people in a really, really uncomfortable spot, I would say. I think the lack of control point is, is very important. And this is something that I talk about at length in the book. So people do become uh, it, uh, anxious and stressed and unhappy as a result of following politics, whether it's on TV or social media. It really is upsetting for a lot of people who follow it. You say, well, that in and of itself need not be bad. So if it's for some very important purpose, then I could see you know, it, it being worthwhile to become anxious or upset. So for example, if you're working to cure a new disease and as, you know, during your research, it's very stressful. You might say, well, it's stressful, but it's worth it because it's going to have this very significant payoff at the end. Okay, that, that sounds right to me. But the difference between that kind of case and the case of tracking political news and political events is you can't actually do anything useful with that information. So you're making yourself miserable as a, as a result of watching the news all the day, all day, and it doesn't really result in anything beneficial. So maybe you cast a vote that's informed by what you see, but of course the odds that your vote will actually make a difference are inconsequential. Uh, so so you're, you're sort of just making yourself miserable with no payoff, which always struck me as a little bit strange. So does that, does that mean that people think that they might have more power in influencing how their lives are going to go? Or does that mean that people have an unrealistic expectation that politics plays more into their life than it actually does? Like, cause I always say that I go, no matter who the president is, I mean, if we're talking about gas, I mean, that's a noticeable change, but if we just talk about if I'm going to put my shoes on and go to work, I'm still doing the same exact thing, no matter who the president is. It's not like nothing's stopping me from going to do that, but it seems like people take it to that extreme. They take it like their life is going to change forever. And I'm like, I don't, you don't, I mean, yeah, we might have a different color or different, whatever team in the, in the office, whatever, but you're still going to stay at your job at the electric company, making 12, 35 an hour and coming home after 10 hours and taking your shoes off and watching whatever cartoon you want to watch. So I do think that that political outcomes can be consequential. So there's an important distinction between the, the amount of impact you as an individual can have on political outcomes and the sorts of consequences that, that, you know, different political outcomes might have for individuals. So I do think for, so I, you know, it, I think people do tend to overestimate the significance, say, of a particular president on the state of the economy, for example. I think a lot of people do have this idea that there's some button in the president's office that controls inflation or unemployment or something like that. And, and that's, of course, not the case. But I do think the outcomes of elections matter, and they can have impacts on, on people's lives in very serious ways. Um, but the issue is whether or not, so if you're asking yourself, should I as an individual go to the polls and vote, even, even believing that the outcome of the election is very consequential, I think the answer to that question is going to require us to ask how impactful your individual vote is going to be. And, you know, maybe this is a bit different in four or five swing states, but for the vast majority of American voters, your vote's not going to make a difference. And so it's perfectly consistent to say the outcome of this election matters, and maybe it even matters qu quite a bit. I'm sympathetic to that. However, I can't do anything about it. And so that's a reason for me to allocate my time and resources elsewhere to causes where I can make a difference. You mentioned Phil, uh, I'm going to blank on that word again, philanthropic. Is that how you say it? Uh, phil philanthropic, right. Phil philanthropic um, organizations or just committees, I would say, that can be funneled into. When it comes to people taking a stand or people being working on core issues or things of that sort that are philanthropic, um, what are some ones that we can do where politics doesn't even have to be involved? So I actually think for, for many of them, politics doesn't have to be involved. So I think for a lot of the sorts of causes that people try to advance via politics, there are even more effective ways of advancing those causes in the non-political realm. So just take a simple case, something like food insecurity. So perhaps this is an issue that's very important to you, uh, alleviating food insecurity in the United States. Well, one option is uh, spending time researching different sorts of candidates and figuring out who has the best position on food insecurity and voting for that person. 
So you're spending a few hours doing that, but of course it's not actually going to get that person elected. So it's, it's more or less an unproductive use of your time. Alternatively, you could say, look, I care about alleviating food insecurity. I care about feeding the hungry. So instead of spending time on politics, which won't actually result in anyone getting fed because it's not going to make a difference to the outcome of the election, I'll spend that time maybe working extra hours at my job and then using that money uh, to donate to a food bank or maybe volunteering at a food bank. And so as a result, people actually get fed as a result of your efforts. And this is more or less the core argument of the book or one of the main arguments of the book, which is for the vast majority of things that you want to advance via politics, via something like voting, you can actually do a much more effective job if you do it privately. Kind of like trash recycling, for instance, if everyone picks up a little bit of trash or something, if they see it on the road, it don't have to be a whole one person tackling a whole uh, land of dump, but it can just be a couple bags of trash or something that's on the yard. Eventually, if everybody's doing that, it'll all work to a bigger goal of cleaning up that area. Right. And so, right. So if, if a fair number of people, uh, you know, take, take the advice in my book, we'll, we could get a, a fair number of people fed as a result. Although, you know, I think one virtue of the, the approach that I advocate is that even if, even if other people don't follow suit and, and you know, you're the only one who works overtime and donates that money to a worthy cause, you could still make a difference. So there could still be people out there who get fed as a result of your efforts who otherwise wouldn't get fed. Now, I, now I should say, I, I actually think they're, they're the highest value uses of your time, of your philanthropic time, will probably involve something like uh, earning extra money and then donating it to extremely effective charities. So I'm an advocate of what's been called effective altruism. And so, so the idea here is that we ought to allocate our, our altruistic time uh, and energy to the sorts of projects that, that uh, do the most good per dollar donated or hour worked or something like that. So what I advocate for in the book is donating to charities like the Against Malaria Foundation. Uh, that are very, very efficient at allocating resources and saving human lives. And so my basic argument is take all of the time that you might spend on politics, which is unlikely to yield any fruit in terms of actual impact, reallocate that time towards something like, you know, working overtime, earning extra money or something like that, and then donate it to an extremely effective charity like the Against Malaria Foundation. And then at the end of your life, you will literally have saved lives as a result of doing that. And so I think that, that that's definitely a trade-off that's worth making. So you say, I'll, I, won't, I won't engage with politics. I won't really track it. I won't vote. But I'll, I'll spend that time on these other projects which actually save lives. And to me, that seems like uh, that seems like an easy choice. Yeah, well, when you, you say it like that, it makes sense. But the issue is starts to become where I have this thought of like, people really don't want to do any work unless it's something that's going to affect their lives. It's kind of like for a lot of reasons, like even with a show, for instance, some people don't do spots unless they can promote something or they can do this type of thing instead of just because it, it needs to benefit your own life. It's, the, I think, a reason why people care about politics so much. Like I said, the over uh, a drastic over rationalization that this politics controls your whole entire life and any move that gets pushed forward is going to affect your everyday life now if you had something like malaria that was affecting a bunch of people you'd have a lot of people worried about getting a, a proper medicine and getting that movement or protest or activism forward but it's not affecting everybody's life see that's I, 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 would that come with incentivization? Because I don't think that's necessarily good either. Like, for instance, Home Goods or some grocery store, if you get a bill and it's $58.96, they'll be like, would you like to donate that dollar automatically on the screen? Now, people can hit no or they can hit yes, like whatever, round it to 60. I don't care. It's an even number. And it goes like that. That's good. But we have incentivization where they're like, we'll give you a pizza party or we'll do this. And it's like, does that, I mean, when you stop giving out that pizza party or when you stop doing that, are they still doing it or were they only doing it because it's benefiting themselves and you realize that money that could have been spent on that pizza could have actually been funneled towards that goal that you could have initially done? And it seems like that's a, with a lot of stuff in history. We've just seemed like we're making a fix, but that fix has actually stepped us two steps back in a sense. So this is a good question. So so I, I would separate the question of of what you morally ought to do 
from whether or not we can always motivate people to do what they ought to do. So, so my, my argument or my view is that you should be donating to, to charities that do an effective job of preventing children from dying of malaria. That's what you ought to do. But of course, you know, you raise the point that a lot of people might just not be motivated to do that because it seems so disconnected from their lives. And I would say that that's an important worry to have if, if we actually, if, you know, if we're interested in motivating people to help, which, which we should be. But I think that's somewhat of a separate question from uh, whether or not they actually have that obligation. So, it, it, you know, there are people who can say, uh, you know, yeah, I guess I, this is something that I should be doing. I should be donating this to charity, but it's not really connected to me. So I'm not going to do it and say, okay, so that I do think that's, that's kind of a motivational issue, uh, but somewhat separate from the question of whether or not they, they actually have the obligation to help. But so let me, let me give you a second part to my answer, which is uh, l- let's grant the, the claim or the, the worry that it's, it's going to be hard to motivate people to donate to causes from which they're disconnected. Uh, assuming we can't solve that problem, and I'm not, I'm not convinced that we can't solve it. I think, you know, p- there are ways to motivate people to donate to these sorts of causes, even though they don't have the, the immediate impact on the, on the donor's life. I would still say that in and of itself is not an argument for engaging in politics over what you might call private altruism. So I would say if you're really concerned or if you're only motivated to pursue altruistic projects that have some sort of direct connection to your life, okay, uh, then just do private altruistic projects that connect to your life. It doesn't have to take a political form. So just to run with the example that I gave earlier, uh, suppose you really care about food insecurity in the United States. This is something that matters a lot to you. I would say, okay, then what you should do is spend the time that you would have spent on politics on volunteering at a food bank or a soup kitchen. I would still rather you have, uh, I, I, would still, I, I would still rather have you uh, earn extra money to donate to the Against Malaria Foundation. But if I can't get you to do that, I would still rather you engage in local private altruism than politics because it, it'll just have more of an impact. What, what about the question of someone who can't donate money only because that they're barely making it as it is, just with the amount of people that can't, that are working two jobs, they don't have hours to donate to a food shelter, or animal shelter, or anything of that sort to do private altruism, um, mostly because they can barely afford to live in the situation that they live in and feed the people that they live in. I mean, a lot of people feel like they're in that position, even though it might not be as severe as that example. Um, it just... It, there's a lot of things in this world that deter us from doing anything extra that isn't focused on like things that we're already so funneled into, um, not just with work, but even with devices. I know that's a dumb example, but it is like that. Like more people are spending time and they feel like they're making an impact with social media when they're just arguing and bickering back and forth rather than actually promoting articles like that's a a strange thing I see when I see the opposite of that which is people that are promoting some researchers work who might not have a lot of followers like top names that are retweeting them like that's a benefit to that person to get their work out there that's a good event Um, that those acts happen but I mean a lot of the majority is people just looking and scrolling through or double tapping what they like and liking things and really not commenting. Or if they do comment, it turns into be their own opinion that sparks up this debate that lasts a couple of hours. And it's like, it's not even political. It's just the fact of like, we're on like level 10 and it's really detracting us from a lot of the best aspects of being a person. And that is the fact that we're all so different and we're all able to live together. I mean, as much as people can point blame that it's going bad, it's not compared to a lot of things where it could be like alternate timelines, whatever you want to say. I mean, we're, we're surviving pretty well together, despite whatever examples you want to use when it comes to differences or gender inequalities, whatever you want to say. I mean, it could be a lot worse. There are other countries that don't have it as well. Um, and I don't like using that example because I don't want to use another country's pain as an example. But I think people get into these positions where maybe it's a sense of comfortability or maybe it's people with too much energy being funneled into the wrong thing. I mean, I, I go on social media, but I post once a day and I'm gone and I use my time elsewhere. 
whether that's fixing improvements in my life or talking to a friend who might need it. I mean, those are small to me, private acts of altruism. It doesn't just need to necessarily be a charity, but caring for your fellow person as well to it brings a, I think what you're talking about is like kind of like a ripple effect it brings a bigger drastic impact when one person plays a part that affects the whole community in a sense. I would certainly agree that we should not conceive of social media engagement as, as uh, altruism or, or fulfilling a moral obligation, at least not in most cases. I think that's, that's recreation at, at best. Uh, and is often not even recreation because it seems more stressful than relaxing in a lot of cases. But, but to go back to, to your uh, earlier case of somebody who just doesn't have the time, I, I think in that case, right, it, it, it could be too demanding for that person to ask that person, hey, now work overtime on top of everything else to earn to donate to the Against Malaria Foundation. I think that's a, that is a completely fair point. But I would also say uh, it, it's, it would also be unfair to ask that person to engage in serious political activism on top of everything else as well. So my basic view is just, is just sort of the following. Take whatever time and energy you think people should be allocating to political activism and just reallocate that to private altruism. But there might be people for whom it would be too demanding to ask, ask them to do either. And, and that, that strikes me as fair. I'm just saying insofar as you're doing something, something you know, in the realm of activism or philanthropy, uh, do something that actually has an impact uh, and make, making the world a better place and helping people. And typically politics is not something that does that, but private altruism is, or at least it, it can be if you do it right. And, I'll, and I will also say too, I mean, part of the reason why uh, I, I would prefer that people donate to something like the Against Malaria Foundation is because the, the, the people who are the poorest in the world are typically not Americans. Uh, even people who are in poverty by American standards are, are relatively rich by global standards. And so my view is that you should allocate your resources, your philanthropic resources, uh, in the ways that do the most good, that can relieve the most suffering or produce the most happiness. And so typically that's going to involve sending money to people who, who aren't in, in the United States or sending resources to people who aren't in the United States. I mean, I hear your point. Uh, the thing is, is how do you get someone that's brainwashed into politics to see that point as well, too? Like when you're speaking or you're talking about these subjects, I mean, do you have anybody besides maybe people that don't have their hands so invested into politics that kind of sway? It seems like if you're already sucked into that thing, it just gets it falls on deaf ears. You know what I mean? Like I've seen a lot of people do a lot of incredible good things. And they're not involved in politics at all. And it's not donating overseas or anything. It's just working on sustainable things for their cities. I mean, those are and anything, honestly, just being finding a way to make not life for you, but life for everyone around you a little bit better because it gives everyone a little bit more time and shows them they don't need to be invested into something. I'm just curious when, if you're speaking about this type of subject, like we're talking about, if you're speaking about that openly, or you're talking about that as a researcher or just putting a book on it. Are you having people that are, are invested in politics that are looking for a, like a saving rope? I wish I knew how to persuade more effectively uh, th th than I do, to be honest with you. So it is it's hard to persuade people who are really invested in politics uh, that their time could be better spent elsewhere. And I should also say, though, my, I, I don't take my argument to apply to everyone. So I think that there are people who work in political capacities uh, who should continue doing that because they have an impact. So for example, if you, if you actually work in Washington or for a think tank, uh, I think that can be high impact in the same way that it can be high impact for someone to farm or to be a dentist. I just wanna say not everybody has to be a farmer and not everyone has to be engaged in politics. So that's, that's a bit of an initial response to, to your question. Um, yeah, in, in terms of, you know, other people, I, I don't, I think one thing is just uh, sort of making making some of the problems that can be solved vivid. So I think, look, you have it within your power to, to literally save people's lives. And in other contexts, you would think that's heroic. So for example, if, so I give this example in my book, if you came across a, a well and you heard a child in the well and the child was trapped in the well and you could save that child's life by you know, getting a rope, lowering it down and pulling out the child and you save their life, that would be an extraordinary moment. And you would remember it for the rest of your life and you would feel really, really good about that. 
that you saved a life. But we, we kind of have it in our power to do that. It's not quite as immediate as the well example, but we can save lives nonetheless if we earn to give to effective charities. And so I think when you, refl when you reflect upon the benefit of effective help, that can be motivating as well. I think it comes that comes with education as well, too. I've talked to plenty of people who've worked for like vaccines that are producing for malaria and treatments for malaria. Actually, one guy on here, David uh, Bell, who spent I think it was like 15 something years over there, you know, working as hard as he possibly can, just researching and helping out the people down there as well, too. And then came back to the States. Finally, like it's it, there are people out there that are doing that. I think it that comes with education, though, because when he was telling me all about the types of issues that people suffer from with malaria and all this type of stuff, it's very informative when you're able to hear the breakdown of it and you have access to that. Now, we have devices that can access. We can see issues and stuff like that, too. But it's not in our objective mindset to do that. Like it's not even the objective is not even politics. The objective is just like going to what you like. And it's about steering that over to like more empathy factor in people, which I mean, the empathy factor, I feel like that comes from just understanding people more. And I mean, if we talk about empathy, I think a lot of people have it, but I just don't think they they, they use it all the time. I think it, a lot of times it's more hostile engagement than it probably is with um or just siding with your own tribe. But there's not really like a whole like, you know, if you have a bad day. You, know, you can talk to a friend, you can say these types of things and you can, you know, confide in someone, but a lot of that, so that's not how it is on as these devices that we use. And it's not in our objective purview to see malaria or it's not homelessness or any of these types of things. Yet people that might do it on the side and talk about it and raise activism to it. Um, but even then, if an article gets posted about them, you see a bunch of people screaming into a microphone and it's like, they might be doing a really good movement, but then it's distorted with that one picture because that gets views and clicks. I think the empathy point is, is very important. So there's a famous thought experiment from the philosopher Peter Singer, where he has you imagine that you're, you know, walking along a, a road, a deserted road, perhaps, and there's a, a child that's drowning in a shallow pond. And you can save the child's life by jumping into the ponds and pulling them out. It's not, it's not risky to your well being at all, but you'll ruin your clothes. And so it's going to cost you some money. Uh, if you save this child's life. And of course, everybody says, well, then you have to do it. You have to save the child's life in that case, even if it's going to cost you some money. But then Singer says, well, then why not think you have a similar obligation to donate? Where if, if the, basically what you're saying is the life of a child is far more important than money, why not donate your money to save a child's life? And, and this is a, a very famous argument that he's made. I think part of the reason why we don't feel the same pull with the donation is the empathy point. So if you see that, if you see a child in front of you who needs help, if you see anybody in front of you who needs help, it's very easy for your empathy to be activated. But when you're, you know, scrolling through Facebook or something like that, and then you see one of these pop up, not pop ups, but, you know, ads or something like that for a charity that says, you know, click here, somebody's doing a birthday fundraiser, that sort of thing, you know, donate this much to charity, and this will, you know, be enough to, to buy X number of malaria nets or something like that. It just doesn't activate our empathy in the same way. And so I do think that this is an obstacle uh, to, to getting people to help is that it's just the, the, the beneficiary uh, of your of your uh, altruism is just not as uh, visible, uh, and so I think that that poses an extra difficulty when it comes to motivating people to help. Well, it's like if it, like we go back to what I said before about if it doesn't affect you. I just think you need to see the actual pain that a lot of people experience. And I don't think you can capture that with Sarah McLaughlin talking about the ASPCA her 30 seconds with a release. I mean, that that'll pull some heartstrings for sure, but it doesn't stick. It doesn't, it's not this lasting impact. Like, I mean, if you were, you know, watching something for an hour and a half, there's plenty of documentaries out there that'll make you want to take action on things too. Trust me, there's a Bob Ross one out there where you see what they're doing with his company and using his name, even though he's not alive anymore and his son's not getting the money. You want to go find that lady and you want to wring her ear out you know but there's i feel like i mean maybe it comes with an age factor i mean do you see that changing with the amount of kids now that are coming up that are having more empathy or do you see it 
You know, I, I think that's an important point to raise. I just don't think they're doing it effectively either. I mean, they're fighting over a lot of stuff. I mean, social issues, sure, all these types of things. Not saying those aren't important. I'm just saying, do are we seeing progress with it get done? It seems like you're seeing a lot like that's kind of like one step forward, two steps back in a sense as well, too, where it's like they've been doing it for a couple of years now. It's not just been this thing that's been going on. And it's it that's with everything, though. It's like we're not talking we're we're more in the line of wanting to debate more than anything and it's not even just with politics it's with anything that comes across but then to say that we get a a serious issue something where people can see people dying i mean it's kind of like renewable energies for instance people want solar panels and they like solar energy as long as they don't have to see it if you don't see what's going on in another country or if it's put right in front of you you start to care a lot more about it and we're disconnected, luckily, because of medicine, whatever you want to say, that a lot of these countries aren't fortunate enough to have. So if you are able to show people the dangers and make them aware of what's going on and who's suffering, these ages that are suffering, a kid, like there's Agent Orange stuff that you can look up that's just horrible, that makes you want to learn more about it. But you're looking up stuff like that, you become aware, you become knowledgeable. I just how do we get that to stick? How do we get that to start being in everybody's mind of like, oh, I can donate this $5 like that. I mean, there's some people that do that on the side, but billionaires, for instance, when they donate to tax exemption stuff or something like that, I mean, they get a tax exemption status. They don't have to pay taxes if they donate a certain amount of money. You're incentivizing them to do good. Um, I don't think necessarily that's right, but I'm happy they're donating money at least. I mean, I just think we have a inherent empathy factor and as people to care about another person but we are disconnected from other people in a large extreme way no matter if you can say social media connects us there's just a, not a lot of getting to know the, your neighbor in a sense or understanding who they are as a person we boil it down to basic labels and i think that's a very big deterrence and a very bad ra uh, route of progress i would say yeah, I, I do think we've made some progress, and, and I think some of some of that, or maybe most of it, is just due to education and public outreach. So I think we see many more people involved in the, the effective altruism movement today than in years past. I think there's more money going to effective altruist causes, and I, I think that's in large part due to outreach and, and activism, and also, uh, you know, and now there are, are you know face-to-face -face meetup groups and things like that, and so there's a, there's a sense of community, which I think is important, and I think, I mean, I think that's part of the reason why people get really involved in politics, too, is that's the community that, that they belong to, is their political group, and so if we can kind of channel that in, in other more productive ways, I think that's, that's a positive as well. And another, another thing I should just note is I do think it's hard to be continuously motivated by empathy every single morning. Uh, and, and, and that's why I would say, look, here's the, here's the easiest way to help is just is, uh, authorize a recurring donation to a really effective charity. So, uh, you know, the Against Malaria Foundation, Give Wells Maximum Impact Fund, you know, listeners can, can look those up and just say every month, uh, I'll, I'll automatically send this amount of money. And then you just forget about it. So it's sort of like saving for retirement. So if every single morning you had to go through your wallet and set aside money that you're going to save for retirement, you probably wouldn't do it very consistently. For what you might forget, you wouldn't always be motivated. And so you just say, you know, I'm sending this, this percentage of my paycheck to re retirement every month. And I'm going to forget about it. That's, I mean, that's what I do in my own case uh, in terms of donations is it's not as though every single day I'm clicking on a button and sending it. It's no, I just authorize a certain amount. And then, you know, as I, as I, you know, earn extra money, I can authorize a greater amount and so on. But that way you just kind of, it's, it, you don't even have to think about it. You don't even have to worry about motivation because it's automatically taken care of. And so in terms of a practical strategy, for, for, you know, getting your, getting yourself to donate or to help, you know, help in other ways, I think automation, just automating it so that you don't have to think about it is probably uh, the most effective way to do it.
Yeah, it's kind of like subscriptions. I mean, Netflix will charge you thirty four ninety nine when your membership goes up, and people don't even bat an eye. I mean, half the people don't even care where their charges are coming from. They see a five dollar charge, like I don't know what that went to. Probably something important, and then walk away. So yeah, set that, that up. Yeah, you right. You forget what uh, streaming services you're subscribed to. So that that just speaks to to how effectively we do sort of offload all that stuff from our brains. Do you think that a lot of people are worried about if their money is actually being used to the benefit of what it says it's being introduced to. The reason I only bring that up as a story came out a long time ago about exposing all these bad charities. And there's actually a site you can look up that'll tell you like what the exact money of these charities is being funneled for and how much is being pocketed. It's like ratecharity.com or something like that. Dude, some of the exposed are really bad charities that they talk about. I'm pr you probably might know a few, but there's a couple at the top of the list where you realize they're pocketing like a lot of money like they're just selfishly taking a large portion of the money and some of it's still getting donated but it's a large amount i mean it's kind of like when you're at walmart and you see the thing you can put a dollar into to help a kid or something like that and you can spin it and have a little fun on its way down to the bottom people just go well it stops them from pocketing the money now i don't think it's as drastic as people think that every single thing is being taken and i think it probably gets used to a benefit it's like goodwill you can donate to goodwill and people do that just because they might want to get rid of something but it's that's the same thing with loose change how many people have loose change that starts to become an issue besides the subscription thing is when we talk about how many people would donate loose change or like a buck or something that they had left over everything's on card now so you don't have that access so i mean the subscription is still a way to go but it, you might see a skew in um i would say money towards charities just from the amount of loose change that's kind of been taken out with cash being gone yeah, I do think this is a worry that a lot of people have, where they say, look, I'm reluctant to donate to charity because I know that not all charities are effective. I would say that the lesson to draw from that is, well, that yeah, that's why we've got to do our homework. And you don't even have to do the homework directly. Other organizations have, have done our homework for us. So I mentioned GiveWell uh, is, is very good at investigating charities for effectiveness. Uh, and, and so it doesn't have to be the case that all charities are effective. It just has to be the case that there are some effective charities that, that, need, that need money and you can donate to those. But, but I agree, it's, it's, it's not enough just to say, this sounds good and therefore I'm going to give them money. You actually you gotta, you gotta do a little research to make sure that they're, they're um, doing a good job with their donations. And the, yeah, the grocery thing I think is kind of interesting. I think if you were really an effective altruist, whenever they ask you to round up, you would always say no but you would always, but you would save that money, and then donate it to the Against Malaria Foundation when you get home or something like that. Now I don't know how many people, you know, psychologically, are wired to do that, but I think if you are truly interested in doing the most good with your charitable dollars, then you would say, no, nah, like I don't want to round up, or when, you know, um, the, you know, there's a charity outside the supermarket or something like that, you wouldn't ever give them money. You would always save that money, and then when you get home send the money that you would have donated to them to a more effective charity. Like I said, I don't know how many people would actually do that, but I think that would be the optimal philanthropic course of action. I think a lot of people will donate if they're given the opportunity to, or just it's placed right in front of them. It's kind of like when you see uh, the Salvation Army and the Santa Clauses outside ringing a bell, a lot of people put a dollar or $2 in there. But also there I've noticed walking up into a store someone that waits for someone to walk by to see that they donated like that's an issue in its own i mean it's laughable but in a sense people want to show people that they're doing good things and that's kind of i don't consider that i mean we're also kind of stating that like people have this inherent need to want to help other people like i said i think it doesn't really boil down to that i mean there's probably a lot of people out there that want to help if they can help but it, it's not in the purview of things. A lot of people work at self-preservation on aspects as well too. And in some cases per case, whatever, they might be worried about that. But that <sighs> Salvation Army thing is really weird to me because I think it, that's not a good, that's not a good thing when you see somebody donating and they're looking for someone to watch them donate. It's like, I've seen that. Yeah. That's creepy. No, no. Uh, me too. No, I'm laughing because it's such a common phenomenon. Like I'm totally with you. I see it all the time. So that, so I agree. Like I think that's right. And there's like interesting stuff about. So it is a very common phenomenon. I think where people are looking around to make sure that they get credit for the donation. Um, and you know, there's interesting 
work done on uh, anonymous donations or so-called anonymous donations where you know, it's a, it, an art wing is donated by the anonymous benefactor, but apparently everybody in the art community knows who the anonymous benefactor is. So it's not really anonymous because people, people want credit. They, they want their charitable work publicized. And you see this in politics too. I, you know, I like to, I like to joke about this, but you, you know, the, the, uh, the I voted sticker, yeah. Every, it's not enough to vote. Everybody's got to have the, the I voted sticker on their shirt on a, and I, t this is what I tell people to, so, so my view is, look, uh, I, I very much care about results. So if you give to an effective charity because you want public credit for it, that's fine by me, Just do it. And if your motivation is to get credit, you know, that's totally fine. But people say, look, here's why I want to vote. It's because I don't want people to think I'm not voting. I want the sticker. And I say, well, here's what you do. If you're really worried about that, Go, and this is true, go on Amazon, you can buy a lifetime supply, a huge roll of I voted stickers. Just put it in a drawer every election day, pop one of those on and nobody will know that, you know, and I'm like, I'm fine with that. If that's your reason for focusing on politics, as opposed to more effective forms of altruism, just buy the stick. I'll buy you the stickers if that's what right. it takes. Is, is there that many people that are worried about someone will see them saying that they didn't vote. I think I've said that multiple times that I haven't voted. I don't, I don't know, but th this is a surprisingly common response that I get. And, and I should also say too, uh, like I said, I, I'm, I'm more concerned about results than motivation. And so one thing I think that's important is, is working within actual human psychology. And so what this might mean is if we're trying to motivate people to donate to, say, the Against Malaria Foundation, you know, when you when you run a fundraiser like that for uh, for uh, a charity on Facebook, it can tell you this person donated. And that's that's fine by me. So if you say I want to donate to the Against Malaria Foundation for this person's birthday on Facebook because I want my name to pop up. And so all my friends can see that I donated. That's cool. That's fine by me. And maybe we should be doing more of that to encourage people to get public credit for their donations. I, I have no objection to that whatsoever if that motivates people to give. Yeah, but how much are they taking out of the donation that you put in? It's kind of like with Patreon or with any of these things to support a podcast or anything of that sort. GoFundMes, for instance, you're donating to a GoFundMe. They take a small portion of that, even though that they say it's, oh, they don't do that. Yeah, they do. There's a tax thing at the end of it. Patreon's like $1.50 per $5 a month that someone can do that. And it's like, it stops people. I know a lot of people are like, I, I don't want to do that. Like even any merch site or anything that does it for free. I mean, it's their business service. You're they're entitled to making a little bit of money, but you know, we don't have any effective means of donating in a sense where people feel like they have security in that. Now we can say that there are corporations out there, but a lot of people go, yeah, it's not the majority. It's not this. And they'll bring examples to that. But even with, is it just, is it media attention? I mean, we see the NFL talk about, you can donate to this, you can save this foundation. Now they probably pay for that time slot and that thing to be able to do so. But what about streamers? I mean, you got independent streamers out there, YouTubers, people like myself, for instance, that are more than happy. Well, actually Twitch would be a better platform because you get the money immediately right when you say it. Um, but to, for people to, they want to see their name pop up. They want to see the hundred dollars donated. So someone says, Hey, thanks for the money and does that, but look out, reach out to streamers, reach out to Twitch people. I mean, you, it's taken a new form of media before you used to try and get a TV slot to talk about your issues, but that's not probably going to happen as a lot anymore. Just because if you're not talking about gender inequality, or if you're not talking about this, you're not getting a time slot. Cause that's everybody wants to see that on the news and the news is stuck on it. It is, it is really interesting and fascinating how, you know, the, the internet has kind of democratized media in a way. And, but, but I think that could be, you know, that, that could be used for a good purpose where you say, look, you know, to some extent, the argument that I'm making and the arguments that, that effective altruists make in general, there's, there's sort of niche arguments uh, where, you know, you're, you're probably not going to find a whole lot of them on uh, CNN. But if you have a, a relatively small platform, uh, you could still do some good. So you could still reach, you know, I, I don't know what the, what the audiences of, uh, you know, the, the streams are in a lot of cases. I know in some cases they're really big, but even if you can only reach out to a few hundred people, but you could motivate them to, to donate where they, they otherwise wouldn't, that's still, that's still good. Uh, and, and, you know, who knows, it might even be the case that they have, that, that, you know, these shows are already out there 
and I just don't know about them. But yeah, if they, you know, if you motivate people because they they like seeing their name pop up on the screen as somebody who gave money, that's okay. I'm I'm fine with that. I, I don't know exactly how the mechanics of that would work in terms of uh, donating, uh, but I have no problem with that sort of thing in principle. Well, that's how you get. Honestly, it's where it's going to take off. I mean, you have a large amount of younger generations that have a general care about issues that are going on. And I think you can easily take them away from the political side of things and funnel them into something where their money actually might be used for some good. Um, and that does come with maybe websites, for instance. I mean, some giant corporations like WordPress or anything you can make a blog on, I feel like they should give you an option to put a donate link at the bottom. I mean, just say, hey, we can put this at the bottom of your website. It's no charge or anything like that and just helps fun funnel this and you get to choose your charity or whatever. Um, but there's you can add that sure but it's like on a list on page five like nobody's going to page five to go pull it like the even the people that say they are doing this and they are doing that facebook for instance will give you many options to donate but is it accessible for every single person to find it is it right in their purview or is it an app like a dragon city or something that you that they know you like playing or something that they've heard you play or an amazon recommendation it's more skewed to business rather than uh, beneficial aspects of just, I mean, human kindness. Yeah, I do think it's important that, that we make it as costless as possible to help and to help effectively. It, right. So, you know, I, I don't know enough about the mechanics of it to, to make it work. You'd have to ask a non-philosopher, uh, I, I think, for advice on that. But yeah, just something where it's, you know, I know that Amazon, for example, you can, you can, uh, you know, donate via them and some in, in cases like that. So yeah, I think it's important that we say we make it as easy as possible. And that's why like, even though those Facebook fundraisers, you know, you, you were talking earlier about maybe Facebook takes a cut of the donations. I, I, I don't know off the top of my head, uh, it, you know, to what extent they do that. But one of the nice features of those sorts of fundraisers is you could just be scrolling through your feed and then it pops up and you click the button and, and then if you already have your, your credit card information stored, it really is, I don't know, 45 seconds to make a donation. And I, I think that matters. I think people will spend 40, you know, they, you know, talking about empathy, they become motivated to help. It's very easy for them to quickly act on that motivation and they'll do it. You've got to drive for an hour to act on it, then you're a lot less likely to do it. So I think removing barriers to effective giving is a really important cause. You kept mentioning the word argument whenever you would speak. And I kept thinking, I was like, you don't really, it's not an argument. It's just kind of like, hey, there's this here too. Like, let's not forget this. You know what I mean? Which it does get forgotten in a lot of sense for a lot of at least people like myself, for instance, the general public going to work, going home, not really doing a whole lot you know, just doing the same kind of things to be able to survive. Um, it's not, it's not in a lot of people's purview. It's not in a lot of people's ideas. I mean, it's not an argument. It's just a bias of like, if you're tired of politics, if you're tired of being invested in something and shouting into a void, why don't you try something that could actually be beneficial to save somebody's life? It's just giving an option. It's not even a bad option. It's not an argument. Yeah. <laughs> so this might be a case, right? So philosophers, tend to use argument a bit differently. So when I say argument, I just like, I'm giving you reasons in favor of this sort of thing, you know, food for thought, those sorts of things. Whereas I think when most people, when, when non-philosophers talk about argument, it's, you know, getting angry and yelling at each other and that sort of stuff. But right, so, so I just think that, that there are compelling reasons for people to spend less time on politics, more time on effective giving. And the other thing, the other thing too, this is maybe a fringe benefit, it'll make you happier. It makes you so, feel good. It makes it, it does. It makes you feel good. Like effective giving does make you feel good. Politics tends to make you feel bad. And so if you're looking for a self-interested reason to, to take my advice, there it is. You, you'll, you'll just be happier if you reallocate your time away from politics and towards philanthropy. Because I was thinking, I was like, it's kind of like mowing your lawn. It's when you mow your lawn, your, your own lawn, you feel good. It's tiring, but you feel good. Yeah, I accomplished this goal. But then if you hired someone to do it, the lawn gets done, the goal task is completed, but you don't feel the same. It's, it's very weird. You, you knew you pay someone to do it, but it just feels better when you do the work yourself. And I think that comes with donating as well, too. You don't need to tell people you donated. You still get the same reward from it. I mean, what, you get an extra paddle in the back or something like that, but internally, spiritually. And like I said, that comes with younger generations. That comes with 
people that are more in tune to this aspect of other people as well too. But I, the information thing though, when we talk about po- you can get away from politics in that aspect of things. I mean, you need something on a giant platform to be able to promote that. You know, you have Bill Gates that talks about it, but a lot of people don't like Bill Gates, you know, whether he's been slandered by the political side. But there's, you know, there's a lot of people that are doing good that don't want to talk about it and they don't feel the need to talk about it because they're doing so much. But I've talked to plenty of people. You wouldn't expect them to have a charity. And next thing you know, they drop a charity thing on there. And it's like, okay, so you're involved in that, too. And it's like it's just interesting to know that a lot of people aren't bragging about the things that they're doing. You know, it's a. It's a, it's a moral thing. I think a lot of people just see it morally right not to just talk about all the good that they're doing, but a lot of people, that's only what they want to do. I will say you and I have very different attitudes towards mowing lawns. I get no sense of satisfaction. I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do, I, I've mowed my fair share of lawns in my day and I'm, I'm, I'm done. I've got no interest in mowing lawns again. Um, but, but right, so I do think, um, yeah, you, you, particularly for people who, who do have a public platform, um, you know, publicizing the, the charities that they donate to and the work that they do can, can be a good thing, I think, if it's done in an, in an artful way. If people see it as, hey, look, this is something that's important to me, I think it does good. And, you know, think about joining up, think about adding in your donation, I think that can be, can be effective. Um, I, you know, so I, I, I tend to agree that, you know, it's probably best if your primary motivation for giving is, is to do good, is to benefit people, rather than to show off how virtuous you are. Um, like, I think, that's, I, I think that's probably the best. But I also think for, for people who do have an audience, sort of, you know, diplomatically uh, promoting effective charitable causes uh, can can have an impact. Uh, I, I mean, there are books out there. So not just academics. You, you know, you mentioned you know people who are who are extremely wealthy uh, have have engaged in a lot of philanthropic projects and and brought them a fair amount of publicity. I think that I think that can be a good thing for sure. We need people like Jim Carrey. You ever see Jim Carrey do an interview and talk about just any idea of benefiting or doing anything for mankind? First of all, he slanders Hollywood. He's like. He looks like he drank the Kool-Aid and it's like, or took the blue pill and kind of slipped out of the matrix. Cause he's like making fun of like every single person. He's like, I don't need to promote myself, but any interview you look up of Jim Carrey, it's this very clear, like speaking where he's like, do a movie for what I do a movie. Cause I want to do a movie. I don't need, I don't feel the need for me to tweet something about a political stance or anything of that sort. It does nothing. And what, what get a bunch of likes. And it's like, you hear that. It's like, I don't expect that from you. Cause all we see now is celebrities taking stands on things. Like they have an impact into our minds or something like that. But he's like, no, like all he wants to do is paint and he wants to do good, like donate his money places and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, people like that. I mean, Johnny Depp, I'm pretty sure besides the trial that's going, on he donates a lot of his money to charity as well too and also buys homes that he doesn't live in yeah so i haven't seen any of those interviews. I'm so <laughs> i'm so out of touch i remember you're too young ace ventura pet detective That's, how am i too young for that i was like 10 I when think, that came I think out it was probably out before you were born wasn't it i don't even how old do you think i am well you said you're what 24 yeah that was definitely it's not 20, i think it's, it's like got to be like 24 years old i would think at least i don't know i don't know i can't even keep track uh, but but yeah no there there's something admirable about the just like the, the I don't know the the quietness of somebody who says look I don't need to make a big deal I just want to help people like that that's what I care about I I don't need the I don't need the the Facebook likes or whatever the case may be so I'm with you on that like I said I, you know if you if there is a way for you to bring attention to a cause in a way that's actually going to do good not not to get the Facebook likes but to actually motivate people to help I I do love that. But I am always, but it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, uh, it's too often motivated by the desire to get, to get the likes on Facebook, which I think is not a good motivation. Yeah. They did a study on that like button. Um, and that's why they added the angry thing in there as well, too. Um, it's because they realized that the angry emoji actually gets your content more views than a like emoji does. Cause people want to see something to be outraged by. And it's just like, that's a start from politics, man. Like everyone loves, I feel like they like it because it's like this weird, like combative type thing. And necessarily, I don't even know that you're conscious that you're doing it at times either. I think you a hundred percent think that this person's wrong in a lot of sense, but 
it it started there and it leaks into everything. I mean, we see debates with food wars now. People, Arby's is better, Wendy's is better, this is better, this is better. It boils down, starts going leaking everywhere. Where I go, you need to like take less time from that and then work on the actual things that matter, which is things that are are going on that you do have an impact in. You know, you can't change this if someone's been elected. You can't do that, but you can focus on other things that might not necessarily even be in your community. It's nice to work in your community, but you can expand out as well too even donating money i don't think do adopting a dolphin is real um it might be tough to pull off for yeah. most people i've yeah. been fooled a couple of times they say you adopted one and they send you a picture with a certificate oh i see okay yeah so you're not it's not like you got a tank in your backyard that no. you're keeping the doll i was gonna say that seems that seems implausible a but a lot of work but yeah <laughs> i i agree about the combativeness point i mean uh, I, I am not remotely the first person to draw this comparison, but, but a lot of people have suggested that political partisans resemble sports fans, where, you know, sports fans, you, you got your team and you got the rivals and you sort of always love your team and you always hate your rivals and you might even hate your rivals more than you like your own team. And this is, this, there's actually evidence that this is the case in politics too, where people dislike the other party more than they like their own party. And so this be, so, so then you can see how immersing yourself in political debate is going to lead to a lot of those, those angry reacts on Facebook. Um, and yeah, and so that, like, that's also part of the reason why constant engagement with politics is probably not great for your well-being because you're constantly angry. And so you're making yourself constantly angry. You're picking fights with people for no greater purpose. Like I said, I'm, you know, I'm not averse to people getting upset or to getting in fights, getting into arguments uh, when it has a, a good result. But when it doesn't, then it just seems kind of pointless. It seems like it's making you angry for no good reason. And so that's all the more reason to do something that's gonna make you happy, donate, donate to an effective charity. And then you can spare yourself the angry reacts. Even with donate to a charity, it's like the same thing of just trying more meditation as well too i'm not a yoga guy at all i'm not a meditation guy at all but the people i've talked to who've been like buddhists who have been like in a form of meditation or do these types of relaxation type techniques and they don't talk about politics it doesn't even get brought up they're more inspired to go do these actions that help the community and do these types of things and i think that's a recognition between that there's more than just this one thing you know, for a lot of people, it is just one thing. Like we're very, very quick to jump to the point of like, we need one person to put on the cross and we need one person to be our hero. You know, this type of aspect, we look for a savior, we look for a villain. It's always got to be one person. And that's clear in politics. It's clear in things that you can point at, like in a, a Johnny Depp trial, you'd be like, that's the enemy. That's the good person. That's how people have been. And it's TV that's kind of influenced that in a sense too. But I think when you have a deeper understanding that there's not these like side issues, there's more of a inner balance. And I guess yourself, which I said, I don't do meditation. I'm not that type of a guy at all. I'll be honest with it. Um, but from what I've heard, it's like a bigger form of clarity. It's the same thing with the people that care about the environment. Like you just care about future generations. You care about, you know, everything you're doing to produce or do this is it going to make a more sustainable living talking to environmental biologists to talk about, you know, transplant pant, uh, transplant plants, where they just talk about inserting something that might not be a part of that environment, biodiversity, being able to incorporate and sustain an ecosystem, talking about these issues and things. There are people that don't have a hand in politics. Even though they know it does link in, they know that there's like, oh, you're not going to get this bill passed or anything like this. It's going to save this farmland unless someone is promoting it in the office or in the, in the whatever. But they're more talking about issues where a normal consumer can do their part. And it's the same thing you're doing here. Like the only points I was bringing up throughout this conversation, I wasn't, we weren't debating. It was just, these are what people are listening to that are going to hear that might not be in this mindset. There's always that other perspective that you need to kind of think of as well too, which I'm sure you do, but I just wanted to think from that aspect of things. I think you're the, the goal. I wouldn't, like I said, I might have differences on terms of argument, but I think the goal in general, I mean, it's not, unaccomplishable it's pretty accomplishable it's just about putting it in our aspect of what we want to prioritize um which isn't that hard if you really look at just influencing it more i mean making that stride it's kind of like going to the gym the first two weeks sucks 
But eventually that third week, it becomes routine. And the next thing you know, you got a new thing that's part of your routine, a subscription where you're donating $7.99 a month or something like that is a easy fix. Even, you know, helping out where you possibly can, if it means that there's, it's right next to your work, there's a situation or some type of event going on that needs help. Um, look at that. Yeah, that, that's right. So, so right. You, you uh, authorize the recurring donation and then maybe every time you get a raise, you bump that up, but you don't have to spend a whole lot of time thinking about it. And to your earlier point, what one way I do think about uh, sort of our, our obligations to make the world a better place is in terms of a division of labor, where it's, it's, it is good that we have uh, people who are working on politics, but it's also good that we have people who are working on, on other things. It's actually more efficient that way. So, you know, just think about, uh, you know, a narrower goal, something like, you know, uh, making sure that people are fed. That's best accomplished by a division of labor. So we need farmers, uh, but we also need people running grocery stores. And we also need people running food banks. And so in some sense, they're all working towards this goal of feeding people, but they're contributing in different ways. And this is actually a good thing. If everybody said, I want to try to feed people by becoming a farmer, and so people weren't, in fact, doing enough work at food banks or grocery stores, we would actually do a worse job feeding people. We want a division of labor. And this is kind of my view about politics. Uh, so, you know, take something like environmental activism. Like, it's a good thing that people, that some people are uh, pursuing political activism to protect the environment. But it's also good that we have other people taking non-political means to protecting the environment. That's ultimately going to be more efficient. And so my view is that like right now, we probably have uh, a surplus of people in politics and not enough people working in uh, other domains. And so if you're just a single person. You only really have control over yourself and maybe you can influence a few other people, but you're gonna do more good for the world on the margin by ignoring politics and working on private philanthropic projects. It's like why well, I'm interested in uh, the organic chemicals and stuff that people are spraying on crops and watching that kind of play out dude it's a horrible thing when you learn about monsantos and all those corporations out there that are spraying your food and making it so you can create more of it but in a sense it's in the worst possible way where we're digesting chemicals that are really affecting a lot of issues with people's bodies and production it's my side interest you talk about malaria i'm interested in chemical plants yeah and and so this also sort of you know speaks to another point which is you know when when you're thinking about you know, large scale politics, something like a presidential election, think about how many individual issues are involved in that. That's a lot of ground that you have to cover. Whereas, for example, in, you know, in your case, you say, here are some particular issues that I'm very, very passionate about, and that I want to get informed about, and I want to make a difference. Uh, you know, that's something that, you know, if you set aside politics, and you enable yourself to focus on more specific issues, you could probably become more informed. If you're not trying to, you know, uh, inform yourself about 24 things, you're just trying to focus on one or two things, you'll probably have more information. And you can probably focus more intensely on the, the activism with respect to those issues, too. So I think that's another, another benefit, too, is that you can just become more targeted in your activism or your philanthropy. If you're not focused on large-scale electoral politics, just one or two issues that you think are really important. Yeah, the sustainable crop thing for me is the big one. You start learning so much more about it. You're like, damn, there's like, it's, it's in everything. It's definitely a time consumption thing. If we had farmers had more time to produce their crop and didn't have to work on such uh, cuts or hit this deadline every single time, we wouldn't be looking to more, I guess, effective, but also very dangerous ways of being able to produce the crop faster. Um, and that starts with so many issues of self sustainability, making people more accountable for creating their own food and also food abundance as well, too. A lot of issues there, but. We'll go into that. Um, Chris, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, man. Is there a place where people can find you? Any links, any charities you want to promote? Well, so like I said, the Against Malaria Foundation, uh, GiveWell is fantastic. GiveWell's Maximum Impact Fund in particular. Uh, you can you can follow me on Twitter if you want, uh, C.A. Freiman, uh, F-R-E-I-M-A-N. Uh, but yeah, the, the pleasure was mine. Thank you for having me. Yep, thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.